Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Omar, here, back in the ENT clinic. Now, some of you may be wondering, why did he come in through the window? But, you know, we're not here to talk about matters of law. We're here to talk about matters of medicine. Specifically, today's topic, quinsy and tonsillitis. Now, I will be presenting today with my colleague Nicola, who was meant to meet me here a little while ago, actually. This is a view of the pharynx as seen through the mouth. You can see the tongue, the pharyngoglossal and palatoglossal fold between which lie the palatine tonsils. The palatine tonsils are a collection of lymphatic material involved in the immune regulation of the aerodigestive tract. They are also part of Waldea's ring which includes the tubal tonsils, the lingual tonsils at the base of the tongue and the pharyngeal tonsils at the back of the nasopharynx. These are commonly referred to as adenoids. However, in day-to-day -day parlance, or speak, the word tonsils tends to refer to the palatine tonsils, such as, oh, I think my son has tonsillitis, or as I choked him, I felt his tonsils. A common condition in children is tonsillar hyperplasia. Chronically enlarged tonsils, notably the adenoid or palatine tonsils, which can cause conditions such as obstructive sleep apnea. This is a very common cause for children to undergo adenotonsillectomy or having their tonsils removed. Another cause of enlarged tonsils is bacterial or viral infections, causing tonsillitis. Recurrent tonsillitis is also an indication for having one's tonsils removed. Most episodes of tonsillitis are viral in origin. However, some may be bacterial, notably from group A beta hemolytic strep. This is commonly referred to as strep throat. One of the important viruses to note is the Epstein-Barr virus, which unlike normal tonsillitis causing viruses, such as the common adenovirus or rotavirus, will give significantly enlarged tonsils and lymphadenopathy. A way to test for this when a patient is admitted to hospital is to perform the Paul glanol or monospot test. Sometimes infection can affect the peritonsillar space, causing initially an element of cellulitis and later collecting pus as an abscess. A peritonsillar abscess is commonly known as a quinsy. Nicola, can you tell them where the word quinsy comes from? Yes, it comes from the Latin for quail's nipple. No, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't, Nicola. Yes, it does. But it looks like a quail's nipple. Why else would it look like? Hello there sir, hi, I'm Nicola, I'm one of the ENT doctors. I've just been having a look at your GP referral letter here. He says that you've got a sore throat. Mm. Um, so I just need to ask you some questions actually to differentiate this between being just a simple sore throat or whether it's something more nasty like a tonsillitis or even a quinsy. Um, so the first three questions that I need to ask you is, have you had any dysphagia? Dysphagia? Um, no sir, please put that down, you moron. Dysphagia is... is Problem swallowing. Mm. No, okay. I um, also need to ask you: Have you noticed any dysphonia? Dysphonia. No, sir, not not the phone there. Dys dysphonia. It means um, sort of a change in your voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have noticed actually that it sounds almost like you've got a hot potato in your mouth. So that was just because of the um, the hot potato in my mouth. Think, of course. Um. Also, the other thing that I wanted to ask you was if you'd had any dyspnea. Dyspnea? No, but what I mean by dyspnea is any trouble breathing. Mm -hmm. No, okay. So they're the three most important questions, the three Ds, if you will, dysphonia, dysphagia and dyspnea. Um, so I just wanted to ask you a few more questions now. How long have you had this sore throat for? Mm -hmm. Three days. Okay, and have you had any cold-like symptoms, any sniffles or anything like that leading up to it? No, and have you ever had tonsillitis or quinsy in the past? Five. I don't know what you're doing. Yeah, any trouble opening your mouth? Mm. Sorry, what was that? Mm. Okay, if you could just answer the question actually. Have you had any trouble opening your mouth? Mm. Look, I'm sorry, I don't speak your language 
whatever it is, just if you could answer in English, that would really help. Mm. Mm. I'll take that as a note then. Check the ops. Ops. Look for signs of hypoxia, as this indicates possible airway obstruction and indicates an emergency. Tachypnea, tachycardia, pyrexia and hypotension are all indicators of sepsis. Morning, Doctor. Good morning, Sister. How are you? Fine, thank you. You? Fine. And more importantly, how's Miss Peterson this morning? Not too bad. And um, what are her obs? What? What are her obs like? Not very well. That's why she's in hospital. Obs. Obviously. From the end of the bed, one can make a general assessment of a patient's condition, noting in particular any worrying signs of respiratory distress, including audible stridor. I will now make some general observations. <laughs> Mrs. Smith. Do you feel like you're in any respiratory distress? <laughs> Denies any respiratory distress. Examination of the oropharynx. On inspecting the oropharynx, you're looking for swellings. Are they bilateral or unilateral? Does it look like a typical bilateral tonsillitis? with exudates and enlarged tonsils or is the swelling more unilateral with uvular deviation? Is the swelling in the tonsillar tissue itself or is it in the peritonsillar region? Indicating a quinsy. If on examination you identify what you believe to be a quinsy, give it a name. For example, Lindsay the quinsy or Ahmed the quinsy. Finally, Lally, is there any food in the mouth that can be salvaged? Please use more I like biscuits. <laughs> Having examined the oropharynx, one should assess for lymphadenopathy and trismus. If there is a significant or notable amount of lymphadenopathy, one should consider the diagnosis of glandular fever. In this situation, one should examine the liver and the spleen for hepatosplenomegaly. Initial management. As with all the patients, first priority should be given to a basic ABC overview. In terms of airway, if there is any compromise, one should seek urgent senior support, try to maintain an airway and give a stat dose of IV dexamethasone. If on assessment, the patient is able to swallow, shows no sign of respiratory compromise, has tonsillitis and no signs of quinsy, and is in no severe discomfort, one may consider discharging the patient with oral antibiotics and analgesia. If the patient shows any sign of advanced infection, including inability to swallow, trismus, or significant discomfort, one should admit the patient Administer IV antibiotics, usually benzyl penicillin and metronidazole. Give oral analgesia, including dispersible paracetamol or diflam, and send off routine investigation, including usernees, FBCs, CRP, but also notably the monospot test to test for potential glandular fever from the Epstein Barr virus or cytomegalovirus. In patients, who have severe symptoms or are very uncomfortable, one can also consider giving a stat dose of IV dexamethasone to help. So, Omar, mm. you know that young woman with tonsillitis? Yeah. I gave you some amoxicillin, that'll be all right, yeah? Nicola, what if she has glandular fever? Oh my God. She'll get a rash. Not just any rash, Nicola. A nasty rash. Call the consultant, let's go. We will now go through the technique of aspiration of a quinsy. Here we can see a quinsy, as we can tell by the swelling causing the uvula to be deviated from the midline and the swelling in the peritonsillar region. A useful point for aspiration of quinsies 
is to make a line from the molars upwards and cross-section it with the base of the uvula. A little bit on either side of this is also acceptable and useful when the first point doesn't work. It should be noted that the Quincy aspiration should be done more lateral than one expects. This is both more effective and avoids the risk of hitting the carotid. To aspirate, we will use a metal tongue depressor, which is ideal for stability. We will then, after consenting the patient, spray some oral anaesthetic and leave that for a couple of minutes to do its work. For the aspiration itself, we will use a 10 mil syringe and a large bore cannula. For the purpose of this demonstration, I am using an 18 gauge cannula, however ideally one should use a larger bore cannula, such as a 16 gauge white cannula or even above. One should disassemble the cannula, removing all the outer sheathing and leaving only the needle. Then one simply connects it to the 10 mil syringe, places it on the metal tongue depressor for stability and carefully ease into the Quincy before aspirating. Some people tie a little bit of tape around the end of the needle to act as an anchor to avoid the needle going in too far. No, let's do one more. No, I can't do it again. We've only oh. one correct thing.